This is Guitar Business Radio, the podcast for the business of guitar. No reviews, no demos, no idle chatter, just useful dialogue and information to help you get the most out of your guitar-related business. Whether you're a guitar builder or a guitar player, or just something in between, this is for you. Now, here's your host. Oh, wait, it's me, Jeffrey D. Brown. So let's get to it. Welcome to the 20th episode of GBR. It's a milestone of sorts, and it's amazing that we got here so fast. And with that, we have a really interesting program for you today. We're going to be talking about guitar education as we welcome our special guest on the show, the CEO of Artist Works, Patricia Butler. She'll be telling us about the development of their original idea and how they created a unique and powerful online learning business that includes a patented video exchange platform. So stay with us for that. And what a great week to be celebrating our E20 milestone as Summer NAM is about to get underway in Nashville. And I would certainly encourage those of you who are there or who will be there to look for us and ask anyone if they've seen us. Of course, as I said last week, we're not going to be there this year, but not to be outdone, we will instead be bringing you no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter for your listening enjoyment. There will be plenty of other media folks there performing that function, and you'll be able to choose from hundreds, if not thousands, of examples. So when you've had your fill of that, we'll still be here with something different. And by the way, I have nothing against reviews and demos. I read, listen, and watch them all the time. I'm into it, for sure. I'm even known to engage in idle chatter when I haven't had enough sleep. But we're still going to do what we do here at GBR and Guitar Business Media. We hope you'll continue to listen and tell your friends. There's a lot going on now, and we appreciate your interest and support. Now, here's something you've been eagerly anticipating for at least a week. This is your source for profoundly interesting news briefs. Guitar Business Radio presents The Shorts. So last week, we had nothing in the shorts. The week before, the shorts was very short indeed. But this week, we'll make up for those shortfalls with something I promised you last week, which was a big piece of news. Some of you already heard it around town in the last few days. Apparently, some information was leaked. But I can assure you, there will be no investigation and no one will be going to jail. So as promised, Today, I'm officially announcing the announcement of the upcoming launch of Guitar Business, the magazine for the business of guitar. I'll let that sink in for a millisecond or two. Okay, that's the announcement. Now for some additional details. Guitar Business will premiere this fall as a bi-monthly magazine. And by the way, I'm using premiere in the generic sense, as in premiere issue, which it is. You know, every magazine has had a premiere issue, whether they admit it or not, as will every magazine in the future. There's no getting around it, and we're not going to even try. Look, there are countless regulations in nation states around the world requiring magazines to have a premiere issue. And these regulations apply to everybody, no matter where you start your magazine. So we're not going to run the risk. We're going to play by the rules. We will have a premiere issue. So Guitar Business is a digital first publication. And what that just means is that it will be widely available in a robust and interactive digital magazine package, as well as a limited run print version available to paid subscribers and, of course, at special events. Now, before I forget, you might want to jot this down. The web address or URL for the magazine is pretty much the title. Type in guitar.business. That's it. No dot com, just guitar.business. Clean, simple, memorable. The preview website is up and running, and I encourage you to take a visit. So, where are we going with the magazine? Well, the mission for Guitar Business is to cover the world of guitar from the business perspective. That's what we do at Guitar Business Media. Our goal is to be informative, educational, enlightening, and enjoyable. But above all else, we're about value. Value, as I've said before, is an integral part of business. Without it, you have no business. As a reader, editorial contributor, advertiser, or any other stakeholder in the magazine, you must get some kind of value in one form or another from the experience, or you won't be coming back. So we're dedicated to providing that value. 
Now, Guitar Business Magazine will include a combination of timeless feature articles, useful tools and information for your business or professional guitar-related activities, plenty of perspective, plus an array of valuable reference materials, and a lot more. Our website, on the other hand, will include timely and relevant news and information appropriate for, what else, daily consumption. And you can read more about our editorial direction on the website. You can also get information about editorial contributor opportunities. You can also express an interest in that if you're so inclined. There's also a section on upcoming promotional options, and this includes, of course, traditional advertising, our guitar business marketplace section, sponsored content opportunities, and more. We haven't released any of these for sale yet, including the covers and premiums, but if you think you'll have an advanced placement interest or any other questions, you can register that interest right there on the section, or just contact us at Guitar Business Media on the contact page by email or phone. Now, the magazine is also on Facebook. Just search for Guitar Business Magazine. And we're on Twitter at Guitar Biz Mag if you want to follow us over there. So this is going to be a busy summer. Like I said, some of the information leaked out last week. So we're already getting inquiries and, and lots of uh, well wishes. And I appreciate that very much. But there's some heavy lifting ahead of us. No question about it. I know because I've done it before many times in my career. But you know, there's something very special about this one. I can't say in all of my decades of doing this that I felt so positive and inspired about doing something like this. There's a lot of reasons for that. But truthfully, it just makes sense. <laughs> if you've been listening to anything I've said at the back of the show for the uh, last, uh, I don't know, 19 episodes, you'll know how I feel about expectations, especially when dealing with variable outcomes. So without those kinds of narrow expectations, I'm simply going to be operating in the expectancy of the very best possible result. I'm under no illusion that this won't be a huge amount of work with the requisite ups and downs along the way, but I know what it feels like every Sunday night when all the pieces of this show, and there are many, get rolled up and sent to the syndicator. It's an amazing feeling. And that's the same kind of destination we'll be keeping our eye on for Guitar Business Magazine. And you can be certain we'll keep all of our options open on how we're going to get there. So once again, you can get a little more information at guitar.business. And I look forward to hearing from you. Now for something completely different. Patricia Butler is the CEO of ArtistWorks. About 10 years ago, there was a problem that needed to be solved. The solution resulted in the development and evolution of a unique online learning platform based on patented video exchange technology. Today, while still offering a strong emphasis on guitar education in all areas, ArtistWorks now offers courses in a number of other musical disciplines and is now getting ready to embark on a bold new growth initiative to take the company to the next level. And we'll hear all about this in great detail as Patricia Butler joins us right here and right now. So, Patricia, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's great to have you here on GBR. Well, I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. Great. Well, let's get started. You know, we always start off with some foundational stuff about the building blocks that ultimately form the foundation for your business and career over the years. So I'm wondering if you could tell us some of the things that represent your building blocks and which you think have had the most impact. Yeah, well, that is a great question to start with. Um, ArtistWorks actually started off solving our own problem. Uh, and, and that problem was having a pretty big impact on our lives and not really a positive one. <laughs> uh, so my husband, David, and of course, my co-founder was trying to find a guitar teacher uh, that could actually help him get to that next level. And he had played a little bit, but um, he had gotten this beautiful new Gibson L5 when he retired from AOL. And it was a lovely guitar, but um, a little bit beyond his his skills. And so uh, he was looking for um, a jazz guitar teacher that was certainly better than he was. And it was his search for this music expertise and his deep desire to learn jazz guitar that really started our 10 year journey. Um, the search itself was pretty difficult and I would say frustrating for him as well. Um, YouTube was really brand new back then, and he didn't want to rely on any, you know, reviews that are put up there. Um, 
because you have no idea who these people are and whether they're just jealous or what they're saying is even truthful. But our house had lots of DVDs and books and even tapes back then. But what he soon realized was that these were all obviously one-sided conversations and he wasn't going to get any feedback or evaluation on his playing unless he traveled. Mm -hmm. And that now meant uh, you know, he needed to go find somebody. And how do you really know if that person's any good? You know, there was just this whole journey. And he did end up traveling and, and being there individually with that teacher was an epiphany in and of itself. After they had had some time together, they had tried like Skype video and, and that was tough because there's an inherent latency. Uh, so you could be playing something, but the teacher wouldn't see it for a while. You know what latency is. And, uh, and it was difficult to sync up time schedules and you still have that problem of, it, you know, is this the right teacher? Is, has he been vetted by anybody? He may be a great renowned musician, but can he also teach? Mm -hmm. And David thought after that whole experience, there has just got to be a better way for these kinds of music masters to teach the world music and for, you know, they're really eager students, in this case, guitar students to get that access and then get the very important individualized feedback uh, that they would get in a private lesson. So he wanted to find somebody that would be willing to record everything they know. And I mean that very seriously, because that's still one of our very important requirements. You have to be willing to share all of your trade secrets, you know, mm -hmm. give us the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that was for really two reasons. And maybe one that's not quite so obvious, but he didn't want the masters of the world really to pull the ladder up and not let everyone else learn what they know. He wanted them to, you know, teach everybody. Uh, but secondly, he didn't think that the teachers should have to repeat themselves week after week and student to student. So he was looking for that efficiency in the model of online teaching. And it, he tried to answer questions that he was really pretty sure a lot of other guitarists had. Um, and that was, you know, how do you know that this is a good teacher and also a good player? I mean, you can hear, but you don't know if this person can be a good teacher. And the only way back then you could figure that out was word of mouth. And the internet just wasn't quite as active and interconnected as it is now. So it was a tough journey. Um, but then obviously, you know, when you do find somebody, you've got to get on that regular interval, interval of, of learning with them to make any meaningful progress. Yeah, and, that's true. Uh, and, you know, your local guitar player might not be the best teacher for you. And not too many adults want to go walking down the street with their little, you know, method book under their arm. I'm going to learn jazz guitar. You know, they really do need something somewhat private. And mm -hmm. so that was one of our building blocks was really getting the the whole learning experience online. But there there was another building block that had a really lasting impact. And that was the recruiting of teachers. Uh, in 2007, nobody knew who we were, and the idea of video exchange was completely foreign. Nobody knew what it meant. And it was difficult at first, to be honest, to convince these top musicians to make a personal and somewhat significant commitment to artist works, to mentor players of all skill levels. You know, people looking for lessons are not professionals. <laughs> you know, they need help. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. Let They're me, trying to trying to break out too. So let me ask you just uh, because we're going to cover a bunch of that stuff sure. as as we go down during the time before you you got started with this, and we didn't want to spend a lot of time on it. But there's always some of those building blocks that transpire in our individual lives, uh, you know, as we're growing up and that sort of thing. That's kind of part of the history. Is there anything that you can remember in your, say, in your own, I don't know, we call it upbringing or just growing up that, uh, you know, contributed to, as we say, that foundation that operates today? And, you know, I think we, we always like to know a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that personal history. Well, your question is about building blocks, and I'll, I'll tell you, my stumbling blocks became my <laughs> building a, blocks. <laughs> that's okay. You know, we love stumbling blocks, too, because that's all, well, as we say, R&D. 
<laughs> yeah, well, indeed. So um, I was very young to begin playing a musical instrument simply because my father was a musician and we had a family tradition of, of playing music. And so I got started very early and he was a clarinet player okay. who taught me first. And then my next real serious teacher was a trumpet player. So mm-hmm. I had this lack of local expertise that really could have helped me as a pretty, you know, advanced player at a young age. So I took the path that's not surprising, and that was to go to college. Right. And, you know, I got accepted into Penn State on an audition because my flute teacher pushed me through the door (laughs) to go do it. Well, how did that trumpet teacher work out with teaching flute? (laughs) Well, he was incredible, honestly. Yeah. He, he, and so he taught me the very basic structure of music, and mm-hmm. he was a talented musician himself. And so in that regard, he, my, my flute teacher, who was a trumpet player, was a true inspiration to me. And it was his tenacity to teach me flute as a trumpet player that kept me going forward. But the next stumbling block was was really pivotal and, and has helped inform what's at place at ArtistWorks. And that is, I got into Penn State and I was there for six months and all of a sudden my flute teacher didn't get tenure and she moved on. Oh boy. <laughs> so there's, and this is not uncommon to have a lack of consistency of instruction, especially in the high schools and in, and sometimes in the colleges as well. Um, it's different for Juilliard. It's different for, you know, Curtis Institute. But at Penn State, when music is not the function, the main core competency, let's say, of, of what that university is known for, people go where the opportunities are. And so I, you know, I twice had these stumbling blocks that really made me later in life have kind of that epiphany, wow, there's major inconsistency out there. And I was sort of hopping around with uh, flute teachers trying to get what I desperately needed, which was help, you know, in, in moving forward. So those were my two stumbling blocks that really became the building blocks of the model that we have in place at Artist Works. That, that's, you know, that's really an excellent way to put it. And I, I don't know that... Uh... And all of the episodes that I've been doing this now that I've heard anybody state it quite like that. So that was, uh, you know, a very nice, uh, nice way to put it. So let's move forward a little bit now into sure. the to the uh, launch of Artist Works in, in terms of uh, what it took to get it going and all that. And then uh, were there significant events or milestones as there generally are in the earlier years in terms of successes or challenges that uh, may have caused you to make shifts or alter the course in some way? So it's kind of a two-parter, but I'll let you have the floor. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, it, as I mentioned before, in the beginning, you know, nobody knew who we were. Mm-hmm. And they didn't know what video exchange was. So we had to go find these people. We had to go find these master musicians. And I'm not going to bore you with how how we found the first few. And a couple found us. But um, it, the challenge was really, you know, to find, first find these musicians. But our goal has always been to provide access for everyone that wants to learn. And it needs to be or needed to be family-friendly pricing. So it needed to be affordable to very high-level access to these master musicians. And it was the Internet and Internet speeds uh, that were uh, an important milestone. In, In the beginning, people were actually sending us tapes which is kind of, I think about it now and I think, what were we thinking? Uh, physical, <laughs> physical tapes? Yes, it was physical what, what, like VHS tapes or something like that? <laughs> Some of them were high eight. I don't, you know, I don't remember. I was, oh, oh. I was trying hard to ignore what my husband was doing in the basement. Got it. But um, I know <laughs> that there were tapes going back and forth from the students and also from the teacher. So that was an incredible challenge. And that just pushed David even further to making sure that this whole learning experience was better than in-person instruction and that it was all online, including the exchange of 
videos between the teacher and the student and and then making that that video exchange available to everyone so that you know the teacher's time was leveraged and and everybody can learn from those teaching moments in the video exchange so you uh, know, let me we, just let me just interject real, real quick are you are you saying that in the early days of when you actually started this business that there was some kind of physical exchange uh, I am. That's yeah. what you were saying. I just wanted to clarify that that was actually going on in the early days of the business. Is that correct? We had to digitize the tapes okay. so that we could then put the contents of the tape online. Okay. Now that means the teachers, well, it starts with the student's video mm -hmm. and then the teacher's response. And those were all on tape in, in the beginning. I got it. Okay. And David hadn't worked out the technology entirely um, but once he did, that's when we filed for the patent. And we can we can maybe talk about that later. But that was certainly one of the big challenges. Um, so it was finding teachers, getting absolutely everything online that were our first, you know, challenges. But you also asked about successes and, and shifts that we made. And um, we started out with David's concept and, and a couple of willing risk-taking musicians those are not easy to find and you know let uh, me let me just ask you one quick thing here and we'll just we'll just pick it up right at that right at that spot i think it would be and i don't know whether we would get into it some other place but this seems an appropriate place to interject a little bit about david's background because we haven't really talked about that and just a just a, a little bit about where he came from because obviously he was a relevant player in the launch of the uh uh, yeah, and, you know, and the whole and the whole deal. So yeah, maybe, I, just give me a couple sentences or so on 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 uh, what you know about him, if you know something. <laughs> <laughs> I know I I know a lot of things about him, and they're all good. I, I'm um, sure, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say maybe you know David's career, uh, early career at AOL, was certainly a milestone for our company because it was that experience as one of the pioneering technologists at America Online in the early early days that formed his knowledge and also his desire to build a community around a common passion. Got it. Got it. So, so, you know, he helped build, you know, with the, one of the founders and, and a small team, uh, the, the very platform that became a household name that was AOL. Yeah. I remember and, when it was called America online. I mean, I go yeah. way back, we all go way back with that. And, uh, and then of course it, it became a AOL, but, um, I do understand that he was a real, one of the pioneers in, in that whole yeah. process, right? Yeah. Well, it had to become AOL because you don't want to try to sell a service named America Online in Germany or exactly. France. Sure. You know? <laughs> so nobody had really figured out yet quite that maybe this thing's going to be global. It might it might be significant. Um, and so, yes, that that part of David's history is is very important because uh, he really wanted to build a community around this master musician who was sort of the mayor of this online community and all of the like-minded musicians uh, that are seeking this kind of guidance. So it was very much his experience at AOL um, that formed the, the very core of our model. The technology was just his his knowledge. So he was it, driving that part of it then, right? All of it, yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. He was. And, and like I said, in, it was his desire to learn jazz guitar that got us started. But then he, he worked out the concept and we had to find uh, a few more uh, um, musicians that were kind of willing to take a risk with us. Um, but I will say that it was honestly bluegrass that was the big breakthrough. For really? Us. Really? Really? I know that's a surprising it's. That's a surprising fact, but uh, David, do you, I, do you attribute that to anything or bluegrass is huge. I mean, <laughs> it used to be uh, country music, I think, but all of these bluegrass festivals mm -hmm. um, really gather a lot of, you know, passionate people and bluegrass has a specific ensemble of players mm -hmm. and, and therefore you to play bluegrass music, you kind of need to know the members of the rest of the band. A lot of people double on instruments, people that play fiddle also uh, may play mandolin, people that play banjo may also play guitar and a 
couple of them might sing, but this is an ensemble genre of music. And there's no easy place, no central place to learn to play the banjo. Where do you learn to play the mandolin? And so David and I got very lucky that we flew to New York to meet Tony Trishka and his manager. And Tony just agreed and, and signed with us. And it wasn't long after that, that that David and I were talking about bringing on the entire bluegrass ensemble because it only made sense. It was the natural progression of what we were offering. So Brian Sutton's name came up. He's a fabulous flat pick guitarist. Um, he's a, a key member of the the very famous and legendary bluegrass group Hot Rise. Mm -hmm. um, and his name came up and some of us just thought he will never do this. He's yeah. too big. <laughs> you know, he's getting too big. But as it turns out, serendipity, he was a guitar student at our pilot jazz guitar site in 2007. And he was very pleased that I was on the other end of the phone and that we wanted to do this with him. So he was in. And shortly after that, it was, you know, more bluegrass folks like, you know, Mike Marshall and Daryl Langer mm -hmm. and, and Andy Hall and all those guys. But then after the success of bluegrass, uh, there was a little bit more of a shift that the more notable jazz musicians like Martin Taylor noticed, okay, they've got some names here. Weirdly, there's a tie between Martin Taylor and, and Daryl Langer and Mike Marshall, and it's through David Grisman. Okay, okay. So then our, I think our next big um, move was with Paul Gilbert, um, who's from Mr. Big, and he says yes. And then you go talking to Jason V.O., the you know fabulous uh, classical guitarist, and he says yes. And Keith Wyatt, who was Paul Gilbert's teacher at the Guitar Institute, says yes. So we, we've had a lot of those pivotal... Kind of, a, kind of a cascade there, I and mean, that's... I mean, I've certainly experienced that myself in various projects that I've done. And once you start to get a few credible people involved, it is much easier. Yeah, much it is easier. so true. It is so true, Jeff. And and so that was sort of the um, domino effect that mm -hmm. we had. That Good honestly, way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it got started with Tony. Um, and I would say there was just sort of one other shift that happened, um, and, and that is that, as I mentioned, my background is classical, and I really felt that that was one genre that was missing. And so we started um, the classical sort of academy or, or group of, of teachers and just struggled to find an audience for them. We're very guitar centric. We have nine guitar courses, <laughs> um, you know, not so many French horn players. Yeah. And <laughs> so yeah. nothing against them. But what what I wanted to do was build a program that could get into the schools with these classical instruments. And so I felt like we needed an accreditation. And uh, so last year, we did get academic accreditation. And now we're moving forward, we're actually doing a, um, an investment round to get the School of Music certificate program built and promoted and into, you know, the high schools and um, possibly even into some of the colleges. So that certainly is a shift. And that was born out of my classical training. Wow. Well, that's some really good information. And that's, I mean, that's reality. That's what yeah. happens. That's what happens when you're building a business and you really illustrated some uh, great examples of that. Um, I want to move on to this thing that we know as your patented video exchange learning platform, as you call it. I think some of our, our listeners would enjoy hearing about what you had to go through <laughs> to get that patent. And I know plenty of people who've done this uh, with those patents, trademarks, things like that. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that and then uh, have you tell us about how you perceive the benefits of the patented thing, the patented process, uh, both for the company and for your customers, because that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, thanks for asking about that. And I, I think it's important to say first off that, you know, David and I did not start a company to um, get a patent. Our business is not built around a patent. 
uh, it's built around a concept, mm-hmm. a, a novel way to learn online that is protected as a technology. So that means that nobody else can do what we do. You cannot learn this way anywhere else. You can't learn music. You can't learn sports or you can't learn any visually taught subjects using our technology anywhere else. So I just wanted to say that it's it's not something we started out as a goal. Oh, let's get a patent on on sure, this. Sure, sure. You know, it's just yeah. yeah. It it just it's not like the patent just happened either. Once David was you know done with mailing tapes back and forth, yeah. and he got it all online, we kind of scratched our heads and said, "Hmm, I think this is a thing." And we realized very quickly that the idea of sharing these learning moments in a video exchange between a subject master and an online student applies to many subjects. And I could see early on that what seems like a really obvious concept had almost universal applicability. I can imagine, yeah. So we started in music because every single person that works here is a musician. And so that's why the video exchange learning is used in music now. But the process is incredibly daunting. I mean, it's not even, you know, this is not good listening content, but I will tell you that you have to defend absolutely every word and every tiny step along the way. And this, you is, have in the to, pa- this is in the patent this is acquisition the, yeah, process. Yeah, yeah, right? in the patent approval process. And, and so you have to, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of energy explaining in very precise language your idea. And so we went through all of that and we started that patent application, I think it was in 2007. And we finally got it in 2015. And wow. So you're talking eight years? <laughs> yes. And very unexpectedly. I mean, we because every time you, you fill out a form or you answer their questions, they come back and say, yeah, we need more evidence. We need more information. Oh, man. You know, and they, you know, it just started really getting to the point where we thought, okay, this is getting expensive. And it's really, we are trying to bring in, you know, Jason Vio. We're trying to record Daryl Langer or, you know, we, we've got somebody else in the studio. And I, you know, how much more time can I put into this? And so it turned out our lawyer happened to be a previous patent examiner. And he said, I'm telling you, you've got something. Please just bear with me. And so, we did, and on uh, June fifteenth, my phone rang. <laughs> and yeah, we got the patent. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, was there uh, a celebration of any kind that took place after that? <laughs> well, I can't tell tales too much, but we're yeah. in wine country. Should yeah. I say? More? I was gonna. I was gonna say, was there a champagne? <laughs> was there a bubbly bottle that was uncorked or? Well, there might have been one might or have two been. Yeah, but it was like a huge, it was just a big thing that really helped us put a stake in the ground mm-hmm. that differentiates us from anybody else that's out there with a video library and where students can't get that feedback. And we've certainly had some people say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, you know, David's even been on panels when people say, yeah, yeah, we do video, you know, responses and feedback, but they, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you can only learn this way at ArtistWorks. And we're proud of that. And we're happy that so many of our students uh, tell us that if it hadn't been for this technology and this platform, which is so much more than just video exchange, they would never have broken out of uh, the level that they've been playing, some of them, for 20 years. So we're, we're proud of that, and I am appreciate you asking me about it. <laughs> well, it's a, certainly a significant part of it, and I think that you, uh, you really explained it uh, quite well. I wanted to just ask you, because you kind of alluded to this uh, you know, a few minutes ago, because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about growth, and... Uh, You told me that um, you guys have funded the company internally pretty much since uh, the beginning. You 
indicated you may have some plans now to kind of move things to another level, and that's going to take some additional uh, funding. And you did mention something about a certificate program and that sort of thing. Could you give us just a little bit more detail on how that came about, what that's going to look like uh, going forward? Yeah, maybe I can kind of tie in a couple of points that I've already made there. So I think you can kind of tell from this conversation that that ArtistWorks has grown organically and it's in music, which is a subject that we know really well. Um, and so our, our growth has been very reflective of, I would say, David's and my philosophy and, and that is, let's see if this will work. <laughs> you know, I think people will like this. And then, you know, we start asking our students, you know, what do you want to learn? And that has guided us to where we are now. And it's, I think after the bluegrass really took off, it, things started getting pretty serious around here. And uh, we realized we've, you know, we really have to put some money behind this purposefully and m make this an everlasting business. Sustainable. And, <laughs> yeah, that, thank you. Yes, sustainable <laughs> indeed. Um, and so we made sure that ArtistWorks got to where it is now. But with the um, the advent of getting um, an accreditation, it started to get the whole wheels turning. And we um, asked our students and also the public, would you benefit from a structured method of learning? Where right now, Jeff, we're self-paced. You can come in if you're advanced, fine. Mm -hmm. If you think you're advanced and you still need to go back to basics, right. you can do that. Like we show you everything. You get all of the lessons. Mm -hmm. And so we've put out a survey and found out that the students really were interested in um, having the option, uh, but not the requirement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of having a more structured way to learn. And that was so they could uh, have a more disciplined practice and they could fill in the skill gaps um, more effectively and that they would get validation on their playing. So we're, we're right now building this 12-week certificate program. It'll have four different levels and uh, we're going to offer it to our existing customers first in case that's a valuable mm -hmm. learning experience for them. But as you said, this is, uh, this is not an inexpensive endeavor. And so, yes, we are, um, we do have an investment round out there. Um, we're, uh, we've already you know, raised some of that money. And um, I think that having enough money sufficient resources to build a certificate is going to make it uh, a very high quality experience. And so the uh, or what you're describing is the structure or something, but you're really not saying that this is, is it spe it's not specifically going to be for one particular course area, guitar, flute, piano or something like that. But it, this may also be applicable in non-music areas. I mean, are, are we still just talking about music? Um, just talking mm -hmm. about music, so I can clarify that for you. We are starting um, with probably three or four of our music courses in probably about September. Mm -hmm. And we will have a certificate program of four different skill levels. And those certificate programs will be 12 weeks each. They'll involve video submissions uh, and quizzes, and there'll be reference courses in there like ear training and the improvisation, uh, how to read music, performance anxiety, in addition to the core musical instrument instruction. And I think we're going to have four courses done um, by about September, and we're just going to continue to roll them out, um, starting with the instruments that we already teach. Got it. Um, so the the other visually taught subjects that are non-music are coming much later. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's not something we even need. No, to because this discuss. is guitar business. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but I, but it certainly is, uh, it certainly is interesting. So, uh, so you're going to do this round, you're going to do some funding, um, going into this. Is that already in the works or? Yep. Yep. 
Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's already in the works. We've already raised some of the money, mm-hmm. um, but we're still got a little ways to go. Um, another mil- about another million dollars to raise, uh, but work has already begun. Some of the money's already put to use. So, you know, we've learned a lot already. <laughs> so De-risked it a lot already. You're, you know, you're, you're seeing that you're going to do it and that means you're probably going to do it. I mean, you got to, you got to know that you're going to do it. In fact, I always kind of say that you got to know that it's already done and that yeah. way that uh, you're just sort of uh, implementing it. Uh, yeah, it's it's already started. And in fact, um, Eric Marienthal and George Witte are in the studio on Monday to teach uh, the improvisation. They're going to record the improvisation mm-hmm. course. Well, that's that's really exciting. Um, let's just uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, you've kind of talked in different stages about uh the teachers at Artist Works, the the folks that are creating the content, but I want to talk about the guitar teachers, and I'm sure that a lot of these principles and things will apply across the board. But of course, our audience is primarily guitar mm-hmm. uh, focused, so I wanted to ask you uh, what kind of criteria you use in recruiting and selecting these uh, folks, and secondarily, is how do they benefit from the relationship? A little different twist, right? Well, I tell you. Um We are deeply expert in guitar, and that's not just my husband. Um, In our company, we have four professional musicians, and they all play guitar. And so once we're figuring out uh, the instrument or the genre that we would like to offer next based on student demand, a a very long process starts happening, um, and it's a very rigorous selection process. Uh, We obviously start uh, and very heavily weight virtuosity. That involves listening to their solo work, of course, their CDs uh, when they're playing in a band. Uh, We also consider their stature as an educator. Have they taught uh, on camera before? Have they written a book, a DVD, anything like that? And and we also look to see if they're self-promoters. Um, but if, if they're teaching online or they've written a book or have a DVD, we look at the reviews of their teaching. What's, what's the feedback? Um, even on their workshops and clinics, what are people saying about how they teach and whether or not the students have had a breakthrough in their playing? Are, they, uh, are you looking for following as well? Uh, yeah, of course. That's important. Yeah. Um, you can, as we all know, you can find... a a fabulous player that is just not a a good teacher. And, and then there's also some, some fabulous celebrity musicians who prefer to pull up the ladder. It's sad, but they don't want to teach the next generation. Mm -hmm. They even fear the next generation and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to share their techniques and, you know, those people are eliminated immediately. But one of the things that might be surprising in terms of the selection process is watching the interviews We'll watch somebody that does a physical interview and get a lot of insights. And and that interview, aside from their virtuosity and their education experience, can be the determining factor for our final decision one way or another. Because it's important to see how are they coming across to the interviewer and to the audience. Are they respecting the audience? Are they addressing the audience? Are they being generous? Are they being thoughtful? Are, are they interested in how they're being perceived? Uh, or, or are they coming across as self-important and, and maybe disrespectful? Because how they act in that interview can reveal very pivotal elements to their personality. And that weighs very heavily on our, their relationship mm-hmm. with the students and our relationship sure. with the teacher. Makes sense. So it's important that we get the right person that can play and can teach and and want to teach. But um, also what's, you know, the name of our company is Artist Works. And we originally started very much with the artist in mind, the teacher in mind. And could we create a, a more leveraged, scalable way for them to teach? And we've taken the idea of traditional one-on-one teaching or the masterclass method of teaching and, and, and brought it online. So there's an efficiency there for the teachers, but we wanted to also create um, a more steady stream of income because musicians' income is notoriously mm-hmm. event-driven. Well, that's true. 
So that was our, our, our big goal uh, was trying to get these teachers to have an alternative revenue stream, but also to have access to hundreds or thousands of students rather than 10 or 15. And then, of course, those eager students want to have access to this expertise. So, and so if, uh, they're, if they're benefiting, as you say, both in terms of compensation, however, mm-hmm. however that's structured, uh, they're also building even more stature. They're building uh, even more of a following. So they're they're getting a lot of benefits out of this relationship, sounds to me. Many of our teaching artists have told us that the influence in their field has uh, increased dramatically since they've been teaching the world music with us. Mm-hmm. So there's a profound impact on their demand, their visibility, uh, the amount they can charge for a gig, all of that. And, and wow. I, you know, our artists are telling us every gig they do now, a couple of students come up to them afterward. I've got to tell you a funny little story. I sure. know we're probably running a little bit long. No, bit. no, we're good. Uh, I, I just <laughs> looked at the clock and we're fine. So okay, good, <laughs> good. Well, Guthrie Trap is one of our uh, one of our teachers, and Guthrie is a phenomenal guitar player. Um, he teaches like sort of country or that Nashville guitar sound at Artist Works, and we were going to a gig where he was playing with John Oates and. It just was just so funny. He was coming out to talk to us before the show. And it was in a part of San Francisco, slightly sketchy. And so he comes out around the side of the stage. And this guy steps right in front of Guthrie and puts his hand on his shoulder. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, is he getting accosted? What's happening? And pretty soon they're laughing and yucking it up. But I see money changing hands. So I'm, I'm, I'm real curious now. So Guthrie comes over, his face is beat red. And he said, look at this. This guy just handed me, um, what the heck was it? I think $140. He handed him $140. I said, Guthrie, he said, well, half of this is yours. I said, what, why would you, what's going on? And he said, this student joined when we had a big sale. We don't do those 50% off sales anymore, but mm-hmm. we, we did. And he got in for 50% off. And he said, I have learned more in the three months on your website than I have ever learned in my life. I feel guilty that I only paid 50% <laughs> and I'm paying you the other 50% right now. That's a pretty rare quality, but certainly admirable in that respect. That's about, there's some good karma there. Indeed. And it, and all the good karma goes to Guthrie. He's a phenomenal teacher. Now, where does that name come from, I wonder? I mean, you know, what? Guthrie. <laughs> God, I, don't, I don't know. When we first met Guthrie, we said, is that really your name? And he, he looked at us kind of funny. He's from, uh, he, I think he lived in Alabama or uh-huh. Arkansas. I'm not sure. But anyway, well, yeah. There were his, some famous people with that last name. but Of uh, course. <laughs> of course. Well, that's that's sounds, uh, that's, a, that's a great story, and I think it just uh, kind of illustrates the uh, more about the nature of the relationship that uh, you have with, with these people, because that's really your, in many respects, your lifeblood. I mean, you you got to have the artists to do the yeah. work, right? <laughs> just, yeah. You know, if you don't have the artists, you've only got works, and if you don't have artists, you probably don't have any work. So, you know. It's really true, and if you don't have students, you, you don't have you don't have any artist works, and that's right. that's and you right. would not think that an online learning uh, experience would be quite so personal. But our artists know their students by name when they see them at performances because they've you know they've shared a teaching and a learning moment online, and that's pretty profound. And they're all uh, very quick to tell us how meaningful teaching this way is so we're happy to have all the artists that we have and and the ones that are about to come too well it does you know you illustrate a good point just let's tell our listeners that uh, we're actually doing this interview on skype uh even though it's we're only going to capture the audio we're looking at each other right now so it's kind of like we're we're having a face-to-face interview i don't do that with everybody but i certainly encourage them to because it's such a an important dynamic it really makes a difference uh i've spent a lot of years you know producing trade shows being magazine publisher all that kind of stuff and we used to talk a lot about the face-to-face experience to, as trade shows were becoming more difficult to populate uh, not so much with nam and shows ces that kind of stuff but in in a lot of them the cost the expense of it but uh there was always a benefit and you know this too to, to having that that face-to-face encounter 
or, or, sure. or even uh, simulating it. So uh, I find this experience uh, not to d- disparage the previous ones, uh, but this is just an enhanced experience mm-hmm. where you and I are be- being able to, to see each other. And I would imagine that that's part of the uh, principle that is uh, engaged in your business. Yes, indeed. And and I've heard a lot of our teachers say that just in the first minute of someone playing, especially guitarist, they can see why someone has been stuck for so many years. And so the video part of it is what's really important. And you just don't get that when you're reading a book or, you know, watching a DVD in, in your bedroom all by yourself. So yes, the visual component of our learning model is critical for students to move forward. Great stuff. Uh, you know, I always like to We're kind of coming to the the end of it, although there's still some uh, room on the tape, even though there's no tape. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, oh, no, we're doing tape. But you know, uh, I'm old enough to have lived through it. Not that I'm old, (laughs) Uh, but uh, I like to close uh, the loop a little bit on these things with some perspective and, and vision. I don't necessarily play the inspirational music behind this part of it, but it, but, uh, uh, you know, m- music education has changed so much in many ways over the years. So I want to just kind of ask you how you view that segment. It's, you know, on kind of a macro level today. And then, uh, you know, where do you see it going in the future? And then, you know, kind of tie it, tying it into to where you're going. Yeah. Well, you are so right. That's music instruction and education has changed and continues to change. Technology really breathes life into an industry that was once struggling to find footing. And the tradition of spending $30,000, $40,000 a year to get access to uh, the right teacher or a master musician is starting to go by the wayside. Of course, especially with artist works, we've we've changed the landscape, if I do say so myself. Our teachers also teach at Berkeley. They teach at Juilliard, at Curtis, the Guitar Institute, and you don't have to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars to get access to them. I think also the traditional bricks and mortar music education is also changing. Um, There has been a a little shift in the paradigm, a very important one. And when I was speaking at the College Music Society's um, conference last year, what I learned was that most of the college faculty and even high school faculty are classically trained so they're like me, you know, they, that's just who they are. However, that's not what their students want to learn because some of their students want to actually make some money <laughs> or they want, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they don't want to play to an empty concert hall. Um, so they're interested in jazz. Um, not that jazz is, you know, really going to be the, the genre that makes you a millionaire, but they love that kind of music. They identify with it. They can relate to it. They love blues. They love rock. And I I can verify that they, they love bluegrass as well. And there's, there are now with these teachers, not unlike I was in the beginning that play something different. They're trained in something different. So I believe that there is a need for a central music education destination that very well could be artist works. And, and we, the entrepreneurs are what's changing the tradition of music education. And, and the longer these institutions dig in their heels and say, you cannot have a superior experience online, the, the fewer students they're going to be taking in. And I think that there needs to be this broad swath of um, education in different genres, not just classical, but in in jazz and in blues and in rock. I mean, they just need to accept the fact that rock is not going anywhere. I mean, there's multiple subgenres of rock that these these players love. And if you don't give them something to hold on to, to pursue, that speaks to them in their own language, they will abandon their hopes. They will not play. They will stop going to events. And I think that the students of today, whether they're they're 
14 or whether they're 45 will go to more events because they en- and they'll enjoy them more because they play the music. And so there's got to be this natural evolution that I think technology in music education that technology can empower. And I, I think there's been some detriment with YouTube in that students graze. Mm-hmm. Uh, they try to pick up a tip or, you know, the technology has brought that to us. Uh, universal access has, has brought us self-proclaimed experts. And yeah, <laughs> That's right. there's only several million of those. Right? <laughs> right. And you know what they're after, Jeff? Views and likes. That's what they want. They want to be popular. They don't want to take you in and usher you through a learning experience. And so players out there, guitarists out there need to find the sort of musical mentor that will help them reach their goals. And technology can empower that. And it doesn't need to be, you know, a thirty or $40,000 uh, bill that you have to dedicate four years of your life to get structured, guided instruction. I think that that's a, that's a, a big change. Huge, huge. And, you've, and again, you've stated it stated it very well very precise uh, you've had a lot of good things to say and what a tremendous interview i'm sure that uh, we're going to get some really good feedback on this and uh, uh, we're going to be very excited to re- release this on monday and for those of you in australia you'll also have it on monday because we actually put it up sunday night so uh, <laughs> but i, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of uh, a busy ceo's schedule on uh, friday uh, I'm, I'm you know looking forward to having some continual uh, communication and, and watching how things develop there and uh, i'm i'm sure our listeners will also so again thank you so much for coming on Certainly, Jeff. Thank you. And I'm anxious to uh, share this interview also with all the students. We've got nine guitar schools, so I, I'm sure they're going to be interested to know more about you and your guitar business radio as well. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, some people have ca- uh, likened this a little bit to inside baseball, only they don't use baseball. It's kind of inside guitar biz. But, you know, uh, what we're trying to do is to, to be a kind of a hybrid and kind of bridge the gap. I mean, we're business media. That's my background in, in business media. But we're bringing it to a broader scale. This is not what we what we used to think of as trade media, trade publishing, even though it's got this this focus. So I think that a lot of people are going to find this interesting, just downright interesting, because people like a lot, there's a lot of people that like that inside baseball. And yeah, we got, absolutely. We got, we got a lot of it here. But a lot of a lot of good stuff to, to work from. So we'll be in touch, and I look forward to hearing from you uh, about how things are going in the okay. near future. Thank you very much, Jeff. You got it. Well, we're here at the back of the show. Last week, I completed our segment called the Value Shot. I learned a lot of things producing it for like nineteen episodes, but it was an experiment, as so much of this always is. About the only thing that isn't is the show intro and the interview. I pretty much know how that's going to go. Of course, if you think about it, life itself is full of experiments all the time. We're always trying something new, often when we don't even realize it. You know, I was kind of wondering the other day what it might be like to keep a journal of sorts and make a note of all the things I did in one particular day that were new and where I wasn't sure what the outcome would be. Of course, I'm not talking about doing stupid stuff just to see how stupid I could be. I mean, you can find plenty of that on YouTube or Facebook occasionally. And it's not that I'm being judgmental about any of that. It's just that a lot of it is really dumb. But I guess I kind of understand why they do it. And it's cool. I'm often sucked in myself into these things one right after another in some kind of hypnotic way. I mean, it's hypnotic. Anyway. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that there's a lot of things we do on a regular basis that we don't know how the outcome is going to turn out. We take risks all the time and don't know it. I think we must all have some kind of autopilot-like risk assessment calculator that, uh, you know, feeds data to our brain in the background and allows us to move through our activities of daily living, doing all kinds of experiments. 
It's kind of like AI in many respects, except, of course, it's not exactly artificial, is it? I mean, it's the real deal. But that brings me back to the back of the show. In fact, I just decided we're going to call this segment Back of the Show. I'm sure that's not original. Certainly not original to me. Somebody's probably doing it. But I think I said in last week's uh, last value shot that in the magazine world, uh, we always refer to it as back of the book. And it's funny, you know, being a magazine and publishing guy for so many years, I'm still mixing up my terms on the show. Often, often in conversations, I refer to episodes as issues and, and other stuff like that. There's other things, uh, but I can't think of them right now. But I think for now, this will be back of the show. And it will be an editorial section, a creative section. I think it will be an experiment. And I will rely on my internal AI engine to keep me out of trouble. Now, the truth is, I don't really know how many of our listeners are getting through the entire podcast, especially all the way to the end. So I'm going to try a little specific and deliberate experiment to determine who's making it to the end. I doubt this will be conclusive or the last word on it. But here it is. So if you're listening, I'm going to ask you to make a small effort and tell us what you might like to hear in the back of the show. Could be anything. Could be funny, could be stupid, dumb, could be thoughtful, intelligent, you know, anything. You can use any of the many, any of the many communication channels we have open. There's tons of forms on all of our websites. There's email addresses. There's social media. We even have a hotline, toll-free, even though nobody pays tolls for anything anymore. 888-777-2404. I love saying that. Now, here's the thing. We have thousands of listeners from all over the world, but I have absolutely zero expectations of how many will respond to this kind of thing. It's not controversial. It's not political. There's no benefit related to it. Why bother? So I guess what I'm really saying is that if I get like one or more responses from this, I will be ecstatic. Not really. I will be pleased. I'll save ecstatic for something else. But if you are the one who responds, you can expect a warm, personally written note from me by email, of course, thanking you and responding in the most appropriate way I can think of. That gives me a, a lot of latitude. Come to think of it, that in itself may be a significant benefit. There may be a reason to respond after all, but I'm still only operating in the expectancy of the best possible outcome. And while I wait patiently for said responses to arrive, I'm going to take the same advice I give you at the end of the show each week. Stay positive, stay focused on the destination, and keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on episode 21. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com. 